He's Bert Lawler from the University of Chicago. He's going to talk about random fractals coming from statistical physics. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation. It's been an enjoyable session. We had a lot of nice conversations today. Um, I'm going to give sort of an overview of some stuff that's been done the last oh, 10, 12 years to start off with, and then talk a little bit about some more recent stuff and some open questions and where things are coming, uh, where things are going. Um, even this comes basically from the basic area of critical phenomena in statistical physics. Uh, for those, I mean, there's some experts here, but for those who don't, I mean, they can be doing critical phenomena. You're studying systems at or near parameters where some major change occurs. Uh, and very standard is the parameter might be temperature, and you have, um, say, the point of basis from solid, liquid, and gas and things. So that's uh, the parameter people normally use is one over temperature or a constant over temperature. This is just so you understand literature. Large beta is called low temperature. Small beta is called high temperature. And generally, low, uh, low temperature, large beta means a lot of interaction. You have long range correlations. Small beta means small, short range correlations. And we'll concentrate here on critical phenomena, which is the critical value in which a sharp transition occurs. And we're really going to have to what happens at this critical value. So short range correlation means only correlation at short range. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, we got to point it back. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean long range. We have long range also has short range. Uh, so belief. So the belief is that systems at criticality in the scaling limit exhibit fractal-like behavior with non-trivial critical exponents. In fact, with some power law correlations rather than exponential rates of decay. Uh, and these exponents depend on dimension. So that's the physical physics in general. Um, and we're talking about here today mainly two dimensions. Uh, and this work, sort of the st starting point of this work, a lot of it, a couple of papers, this is just one of them, uh, Ben Adams, Playoff, Logical, um, who basically said that critical systems with two dimensions exhibit some kind of conformal invariance. Uh, I have looked at these original papers and I really can't understand them. And it's really in many ways, if they, these were not precise statements as far as I can tell. Uh, but Syke, in fact, a number of theoretical physicists, I've never seen a list of some names there, in the 80s and early 90s were able to make predictions about critical exponents using non-rigorous methods, conformal field theory or what they call Coulomb gas techniques. And even though these were non-rigorous, in some sense were non-rigorizable, uh, they did seem to be correct in some sense, in which they actually, the actual numbers they produced uh, were certainly supported by numerical simulations. And it's like you get some exact rational values. Um, some of the mathematics actually was very good rigorizable mathematics. I mean, in a rigorous effect, uh, there were field theories, relationships to algebras, representations of Lie algebra, things like that perfectly legitimate mathematics, but the relationship between the, uh, these lattice models and the field theory was very unknown. Okay, let me just give some simple examples. Uh, my favorite example of a really easily stated, still open problem is the self-pointing war. It's a very simple model for polymer chains in a dilute solution. You just imagine a polymer is a bunch of monomers put together, uh, and it forms itself as randomly as possible, except that it can't overlap itself. So just to put randomness where you're not allowed to be any place before. Uh, I do want to be precise, a little more precise here. So what I'm going to do is I'll put my polymer, we'll, we'll, we'll be essentially two dimensions today, on the lattice. It's a sequence of points on the lattice. It's nearest neighbor. So, and we put the self-avoidance constraint. So that just tells me what a uh, polymer is. Maybe, I, maybe I'll fix Omega naught to be the origin. So I fix it the origin. So there's a certain collection of self avoiding walks. So you can talk about typical behavior of self avoiding walks. When I talk about typical behavior here, I might say look at all walks of length n, give them each the same probability, and take averages. And one of the important exponents, there are a lot of exponents, we'll focus on one today, which is uh, if I take an n step self avoiding walk, what's the distance, it's displacement from the origin, Euclidean displacement, or a diameter, say, or other thing. 
And this exponent is said, well, it looks like the number of steps to that exponent. So if I had just if I, if I had a straight line, that exponent would be one. If I had a completely random walk, uh, random for completely random things, uh, basic factor probability, that would be one half. Uh, and it was a chemical physicist, Flory, who first looked at this in the mid 20th century, and he gave an argument uh, that nu is three fourths. He gave it, it was a very rough argument. To be honest, it actually had a couple errors in it. I mean, he didn't claim it was a rigorous argument, but even fundamentally, in many things, and they kind of canceled each other. But lo and behold, it seems to be the right answer. This is that no? Yeah. Uh, no, I won't. I won't get to. It, it's not no. Um, what I want to do now is not is to make a more precise statement about this. Actually, I'm going to change the measure slightly because in system physics it's more common to have weight. So I'm, let me take a box here, which is it, it's a piece of the lattice, which we can either think of as being an n by n box in the regular lattice, or a one by one box with a lattice of lattice scale is facing one over n. Either way. And I take two boundary points, C and W. And I look at just the, all self avoiding paths from Z to W. Um, and for each, I put one parameter in the model beta. And I say, and I, the measure I give to this path <coughs> is e to the minus beta times the number of steps. So you have an energy of beta for each step you take, or energy of yeah. So this is a well-defined distribution. It gives all walks of the same length, the same, <coughs> same weight. And z is just the total mass of this measure, which in physics language is the partition function. It's the sum over all the walks. In this case, depending on little z and w, you know, I don't have that relation. It also depends on the lattice spacing m, and depends on beta. And this is an example, which is a critical thing. If beta is small, it doesn't cost very much to have, to have more steps. It turns out the typical path is two-dimensional. You try to get as many steps as you can. If what beta is, mean? what? Uh, I you're, Sorry? The typical, I don't understand what that means. Typical, well, that, that same measure. It's a, so you can take, what is the, so. What does it mean for path to be two-dimensional? OK, let's be roughly speaking. But let's, let's just say it tends to have about order n squared points in it, if it's n by n. So roughly speaking, the length of it will be about n squared versus length n versus length. We'll just take that for the definition of this. OK. And for beta large, it, it tries to get there as quickly as possible. It tends to be n to the 1. And as a sharp transition, there's believed in this, in some sense, this is known, that there's a critical value. The value is actually not known on the square lattice, may never be known, in which you have, which, which this changes. And what not known rigorously is that exactly what happens at this value. But there's this value, which is basically has to do with, it's reciprocal of the growth rate for the number of such walks. And then it's expected this typical path is one over new dimensional, where new is this number here. So, this, so you would typically expect number of steps here. So if nu is equal to 3 fourths, if this critical value, you would expect about n to the 4 thirds steps. So this is all just conjecture. Uh, we want to try to take a scaling limit of this. So this function depends on the lattice spacing and the uh, beta. We're now going to choose beta to be beta critical. And everything else would be at beta critical. So that's beta critical. And now it's expected that, in fact, this thing decays like a power law, actually. n to the minus 2b for some exponent. We know what this exponent should be, but I'm not going to say what it is at the moment. And times some constant, which just depends on the domain. So d here is the 1 by 1 squared. So it's just, this just depends on the, on the 1 by 1 square and the two boundary points. It's just some scaling constant. What is the nature of the change at the critical value? What changes? What happens at the? Why is it critical, and what what, what is it that changes? If, if if you're off the critical value, then the behavior of this thing will have an exponential term as well. 
So that's one of the things. So the critical, it's only the critical value where you only have a power law. And secondly, well, I'm going to make the conjectures in a slide or two about formal invariance. And these conjectures about the formal invariance are expected to hold only at the critical value. So, uh, so what we hope to do is describe, and, and this particular curve, the nature of this curve, is expected to be this sort of fractal, four-thirds dimensional thing only at the critical value. At the other value, you should either have with a straight line or sort of a space filling type of curve. Now, I did this thing on the square. I could do the same thing on another domain. So let me just take, say, the ellipse. This, so I could do exactly the same measure I had before, except that I'm restricting to those blocks that are in the ellipse. So I take the limit. The conjecture is we get exactly the same kind of limit. This constant here will be different because we've got a different domain. In fact, it'll be smaller in this case because it's a smaller domain. And one way to make the precise conjecture from the physics community is that if I take this probability measure you get by doing the limit in the uh, ellipse, it's conformally invariant, the probability measure. In other words, if I wanted the measure on the ellipse, I could either take the limit in the ellipse, or I could take the limit in the square, and then conformally map the measure in the square to the ellipse. And the conjecture is that they're the same. Why is there a unique limit to the measure? Why is there a measure of limit? A unique measure? Uh, right, right now, we're just assuming that. Okay. Um, and in the case of the self-avoiding walk, that's not been proved. Uh, but it's very, very strongly believed. Yeah. But it, yeah, it, it, things have limits. <laughs> Can I just ask a question? This is really about two slides ago, or what Jack was asking, but I'm a little slower than everyone else. About the criticality. I guess with the picture, I can tell me this picture in my mind is correct. You have these paths that connect to two boundary points. Right. And if you want it very short, like just n steps, there's only one choice, that's to go straight across. And so you have short paths, there's not too many. And if you want to visit every place, there's also not too many. But somewhere in the middle, there's lots and lots of them. Right, but, so if, yeah, but, but if you summed over all paths, right. if, you did, if, you, if you did every path equal probability, the paths that did that summed it about n squared might be one half n squared mm -hmm. or one third n squared, but order n squared points right. would dominate. They would. Because the number of them is of order n squared rather than being of order n. Okay. So I guess I'm not quite correct then. So the beta, no matter what beta is, the short paths always get more mass. Because the, the short paths beta. always get math. But so, you, so you've got the, yeah, you've got the, the short paths always get math, but we're not looking at this measure. They get more mass than long paths, no matter what beta is. Yes. But there's fewer of them. So the balance there, there's fewer of them. Okay. There's, there's fewer of them. So when beta is small, you, they're approximately giving the same weight. Therefore, the big ones dominate. Okay. When beta is really large, you're, pen, you're penalized so much for having those paths. So there's some balance between how many paths in the yeah. circulation. Yes, exactly, exactly. exactly. I'm exactly. sorry, exactly. that's probably pretty simple. So from a right. physics point of view, to just rephrase that, um, at large beta, this kind of this weighting factor is dominating. At small beta, the entropy, what we would call the entropy, is dominating. And then the critical point is a kind of balance where those kind of balance each other. Now, it's not immediately about all obvious we thought about this, that there should be a very sharp transition. And that something interesting will happen with the sharp transition. But that's what the story is. Yeah. Actually, it's not too hard to show that the transition is sharp. It's much harder to show what exactly happens at that point where it's happening. Just exponentials. You know, if you have two exponentials, there's one point where they you know, one will dominate, the other will dominate, except when they, if you're above the lower critical dimensionality, they're getting transition. If you want to use that kind of language. Yeah. <laughs> OK. I'm going to do, do, do another case, which is actually much better understood by probabilists. It's exactly the same situation, except we take the self-avoidance constraint away. So 
you can't, so, so these are random walk paths. You, you can't see the dynamics here, but they're, they're allowed to visit more places than one. They're, uh, so you can't, this is, this is not a, an arbitrary set of points. It's actually an ordered set of random walk points with some bonds visited more than once. Uh, we could do the same thing here, give each bond weight e to the minus beta, the same thing here, but it turns out exactly e to the minus beta equals one quarter is what's critical here. And one quarter is what is, is just, the, you can think of it as just the probability of the random walk doing that. So in this case, we just, each, each walk gets just the probability that a random walk produces that. And the scaling limit, what happens when you go to the limit, uh, is actually well understood. And it's Brownian motion. Or it's, well, to, to be precise, the version of Brownian motion that sort of, you have to play a little bit at the boundary points. But it basically looks like Brownian motion. So in the other case, is the criticality also somehow related like, to the number of choices you have? Yes, that's exactly, that's exactly where it, what it is. That's the connective. So the, the number of self avoiding walks of n steps looks like e to the beta m, beta critical times m. It, but, but people don't know what that number is. OK. So I want to change this model slightly because they call loop erase walk, which is what you get if you just take this simple path and erase the loops chronologically. So you, it's a deterministic operation that takes this path and produces a self avoiding walk. So, the total mass of this measure and the total mass of this measure are exactly the same, but which, way, which walks they give are different. And the same belief is that this limit should be a measure, this, this limit measure on paths with no self intersection. Um, I cheated a little bit and just drew the same picture as I did for self forty walks. It takes me a while to make these pictures. But I don't mean to apply it to the same limit as self forty walks. But up to these little squiggles, it has a similar feel to it. Uh, let me do another example, a critical percolation. So don't see this, can't see this very well, but up here is basically the triangular lattice. It's the vertices of the triangular lattice. And the vertices of the triangular lattice are colored black or white, each with probability a half independently. If this is coming from a laptop, you probably blow the picture up to the size of the screen. Uh, no. It'll take me, well, I don't know. Right. take me too long to do it. Okay. Uh, actually, it's not important. Um, so that's what this is, except for the, there's a boundary condition on the lowest line, where it's all white on one side, all black on the other side. Um, and there's a path that comes out of this. If I put, if I make any realization of the black and white, there's a boundary path here, which is just the boundary path between black and white. And this path is a random path. It's called the percolation exploration process. It's also conjectured to have limits that are conformally invariant. Um, because it's so beautiful, the first, one of the first um, beautiful, precise conjectures from the physics community uh, was given by John Carty. Think of, think of this picture. Think of these blacks and whites being inside here, we're going to put a very fine line, put blacks and whites. And we're going to ask the question, can you get from A1 to A3 along black sites? Here, by the way, the critical, there is a, there is a critical parameter here. It's hard to see. The critical parameter here turns out to be 1 half. So that's actually the criticality here. Can you get from, is there a sequence of black things that get you from A1 to A3? Uh, and the conjecture was that, in fact, in the scaling limit, as you go down, you approach a number which is strictly between 0 and 1. And that number uh, is a conformal invariant. And in fact, John Carney in the early 90s was the first to actually compute what the number should be using the formal field theory non-rigorously. He did not use the equilateral triangle. He did in, in the upper half plane where uh, hypergeometric functions come in. Uh, 
Leonard Carlson actually is the one who solved the formula and noticed it was much better in the equilateral triangle. And so Carnage's formula on the equilateral triangle says that in the limit, the probability that you can get from one side of the equilateral triangle to this side along black things will actually just be the length of that line. OK, so those are some examples. Um, but trying to make this rigorous is a bit tricky. So the basic strategy here is to try to use the formula variance. So basically, the order is first make precise the notion of the formula variance. What is the formula variance we expect in the limit? Then try to find all the possible continuous things that satisfy these assumptions. Then hopefully for a given discrete process, identify what the right limit is for that. And if we're really lucky, prove the discrete convergence to the continuous. So that's the basic strategy. And to some extent, the math physics conformal field theory uh, approaches are that similar in that they tried to figure out which conformal field theory went to which lattice, which lattice model. But it was done much more imprecisely, at least in my mind. But they got the right answer. But they got the right answer. <laughs> and they got the right answer by considering some continuous object and, and doing things at the continuous. Because it's, it's this continuous object that has the formal invariance. But they got the right answer to some things. Actually, they couldn't answer everything. And at least some cases, they got the right answer, but they couldn't figure out the question. <laughs> 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 OK, so now to be math mathematic, what we're going to do is we're going to now be able to go to the continuum limit and imagine that we have a measure on curves connecting boundary points of domains. And this measure will be a finite measure, which I'll write as this, this constant, which has to do with the domain times the probability measure. Just you can write any finite measure as a constant times probability measure. And one of our basic assumptions is that we want a family of these to be conformally invariant. So the probability measures are actually conformally invariant. I have the probability measure here. If I have the formal transformation, it gives me a probability measure on uh, things there, and it's conformally invariant. Uh, the Total mass actually satisfies a scaling rule based on the derivative on the boundary. And this b here is the b we saw earlier, the n to the minus 2b that was needed to scale something down to something. So that's, that's a scaling exponent. And of course, the observation is that if I want to try to figure out possible uh, probability measures, and I restrict myself to simply connected domains, but I only need to do one simply connected domain, because all simply connected domains, well, that's, all simply connected domains with boundary are conformally invariant by the Riemann mapping theorem. So you just have to, and it's most convenient to actually take the upper half plane and the boundary points to be zero and infinity. Now, as I teach in my class, I guess, you know, do we have enough assumptions about our model to start doing things? And the basic answer is we can't, we, we don't have enough assumptions. Conformal invariance can't be enough. Because I could start with a measure on some domain and then just define it on other domains by conformal invariance. So we have to add something else to this. And that thing turns out to be the domain Markov property. And let me phrase this in terms of the measure on the upper half plane. So imagine I have a probability measure on curves from zero to infinity of the upper half plane. So so what we do is, this is really the problem. So suppose I've seen a piece of the curve. Then I ask, what's the distribution of the remainder of the curve given what I've seen? And the domain Markov property says it's exactly the measure in the domain, the slip domain here. If you think in terms of self-avoiding walks, this is very easy. If I look at all self-avoiding walks, connecting 0 to infinity. And you told me the beginning of it, the remainder of the walk is a self-avoiding walk in the slit domain. Okay. What do you mean the slit domain? The, the domain minus what you've already seen. Take the domain minus, yeah. So, so if I take the self-avoiding walk or the loop race walk or the percolation exploration process, 
Uh, I didn't discuss these in exploration, but it satisfied for this property is satisfied for all of them. I just say this is the simple random walk. The simplest case does not satisfy this because the simple random walk didn't care where it had been. It's for these processes that really leave trails and care where they are. Okay, so those are the assumptions. Now we're going to get well, to the work. The mutation was mu sub h. Oh, mu sub h minus the pure. Okay. Yeah. It really should be a mu sharp. I don't like mu. It's a probability measure, I could say. So it looks like, like more like non-Markov code. It's very non-Markov. It's actually okay. It's Markov on the set of domains. It's not Markov on the set of curves, and that's why that word got used. Don't it? Yeah. And what's the difference between a finite measure and a probability measure? Finite measure, the total mass of a finite measure is some, well, a non-trivial, total mass of a non-trivial finite measure is somewhere between zero and infinity, not counting the two endpoints. Probability measure is total mass one. So what is this finite measure? So what is, what is the definition for this finite measure? By, the, by finite measure, I mean a measure who's just no, talking about no, 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 What is, let me just, I mean, probability measure times a positive constant. Times a positive constant. Is it a constant is transformed in a certain good way? Right, yeah. You're actually, keeping track of this constant turns out to be very useful. It won't be so important for today's talk, but, keeping, but in understanding things, keeping track of this constant is very useful. But, but what is this total mass? For which the measure is it? Yeah. Well, right now we're just, this is just an assumption. Oops, every okay, so here. this measure can be more naturally defined than the corresponding probability measure that's on it. Maybe a die, but You're just considering any possible measure on a space of curves connecting zero to infinity. Keyboard, okay, keyboard up. Okay, yeah, I'll just use this, okay. I mean, here, I mean, here is an example of a, we, uh, let's think in terms of the example I gave the example. You started with self-avoiding walks. You had a measure on self-avoiding walks. Now we're going to take the limit of that measure as the scaling, as the scaling, well, the total mass of that measure, it looks like that. And I'm intentionally dividing by n to the minus 2v, but I'm not dividing by that constant. So in the limit, the total mass is that constant. I'm retaining that number, which turns out to be important. Not so important for today's talk. So, uh, so it's the coefficient of the z function times this power law. In right, yes. So if you think in terms of self, you have some limit of self-avoiding paths, if I Make the domain bigger. I actually have a bigger I have a bigger measure because there's more stuff there. One example we might be more familiar with some of us is like computing the Hausdorff measure or something in its dimension. Often we just throw away the actual measure and we just know where it transitions. But here you're sort of keeping track of not just what dimension is, but what the measure in that dimension is as well. Analysis. Yes. Yeah, analysis. It's, it's an analysis. Just analysis. Yeah. We don't want to. Okay. Well, like imprecise you know, things. So now what is so those are both the conformal invariance and the domain marker property are the assumptions put into this. Um, now let's do a little of the mathematics given that assumption. So we start by a version of the work of uh, Charles Lordner. This is a version of the upper half plane. I'm not sure actually whether Lordner ever did this, but I'm sure Lordner could have done it if someone had asked him to do it. Uh, or did Trump certainly did this. Uh, so suppose I have just any curve growing in the upper half plane. At any particular time t, there's a conformal transformation which will take the slit domain, the domain minus this, back to the upper half plane. <coughs> Call that g sub t. Uh, you have to choose exactly which of the, that's not unique, so we choose g sub t based on its behavior at infinity. So you, so you actually choose, uh, actually I'm not sure, I'm not sure actually, I, well, you choose it so that at infinity it has this behavior. Let me just look at this. So we assume that it sends infinity to infinity, 
that its derivative of infinity is 1. That tells me that, that that's z, z in infinity. There's one more degree of freedom in choosing the conformal map. And that, I, I use that, de, that degree of freedom to choose the constant term, which you don't see. The constant term is 0. So that acts, so this z plus 0 determine g sub t. The next term is 1 over z. And its coefficient is a kind of capacity how big this curve is. And it grows continuously. So what we're going to do is we will re-parameterize the curve so that this, this, this coefficient is growing linearly. So that's a re-parameterization of the curve. How did the endpoint get to, to be the, in, in the middle? How did this? Uh, I didn't specify where the endpoint went. So, 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 yeah, so at, at the moment, when I specified the map g sub t, I didn't tell you at all where the endpoint went. All I specified was some things that happen in infinity. No, but I don't know. Then, then the endpoint goes someplace. So why, on the one on the left, the dotted line ends at the end of the solid curve. <coughs> right, so this, this so thing goes. Right, it's in the middle. Well, because the curve is opening like this. The, yeah, yeah, the, yeah the, the, this is just two sides. You map it, it opens up. You're opening the slip. Oh, you, you opened it up. Okay. Yeah, uh, okay. right. GT opens it up. Yeah. So ut ends up someplace, and so ut is just defined to be the point where uh, ut is defined to be the place the gamma t goes to, by definition. And if you do this, then it's an exercise, and uh, you can, or again, a little more than an exercise, it takes it, but that this equation g sub t away from the curve satisfies this simple equation. So, so you start at c, you start at c, and you use this as your form. And you can also show if you start with a simple curve here that this u sub t that you get over here is continuous. Well, Lutman wrote this way. I'm not sure whether he wrote the upper half length version. Oh, well. I, well, I said Lutman would have been able to do it. What? <laughs> he wrote one version. I'm sure. Yes, yeah, right. Yeah, okay. I, I always call it a Lerner equation. I just, you know, it's just, you know, maybe we'll sort of say, you know, what paper can you find this equation of Lerner's? I'm not sure I can. But, you know, Lerner, you know, if someone had said, asked him, write the equation in the upper half plane, he would have been able to do it. He would have said, it. okay. That I believe. Uh, but Zonad so Schraub in his fundamental paper actually, they said, suppose, so that's a deterministic fact. But now we have a random curve gamma. And this means this function ut will be random. And if you have a random curve satisfying the formal invariance of domain Markov property, then you can write down that, you, that this ut must satisfy some conditions. Uh, for every s less than t, ut minus us is independent of, U, of what's happened up to that time and has the same distribution as ut minus s. So this is basically conformal invariance and the domain Markov property translates to this. And for people who know probability, if I've got a continuous function, continuous process that satisfies this, it has to be Brownian motion. It's the only choice. And there's also a little bit of symmetry, which basically says this Brownian motion you, you get a, has, to, has to be drift free. So you, this Brownian, it turns out the UT has to be a Brownian motion without drift. And for one dimensional Brownian motion, there's one parameter, which is the variance or, or a scaling factor here about how fast wave motion goes. And then the definition of the portal SLE with parameter kappa is the solution to this equation with UT being square root kappa of BT. And assuming for all of you who are seeing this for the first time, I assume there's no way you can possibly figure out how this would look. Well, we still don't know such a measure exists, do we? Or do you just translate this result back? OK. You tr you we assume that there was such a thing and showed it had to satisfy the equation. Right. And now he's going to take show that solutions that the equation exists, and hence are the thing he OK. So, yeah, so now, mathematically, we have defined the maps g, t, and c to be the maps that satisfy this, where u, t is square root capital b, t. 
That's well defined. It is easy or straightforward or, or as easy as solving this equation to show that the max, that you, if you stick any continuous function in there, the GT is well defined. So you, so the G, you can you now define the G sub T's by this equation. It's not obvious, and in fact, it's not true for every continuous function that the GT you get will actually be the slip, will be a slit of a curve. That takes work. That, so it's not completely obvious that there's a, that a curve gamma here. Maybe a more complicated boundary might actually occur here. Um, and that's what I'm just giving as a theorem of Rudd and Schramm. Solving the Lerner equation with a Brownian input gives a random curve. Actually, they did all, all cases with one. For cap equals eight, had to be done a little bit later. But, so, that, 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 and that, so that actually is a theorem. And in fact, the curve you get is very, it's, it depends a lot on Kappa. Now, if you study Brownian brown motion, it looks like this. If you change the variance of Brownian motion, it looks like this. I mean, it doesn't look qualitatively the same. <coughs> when I stick to different values of the Brownian motion in here, I get wildly different curves. By the way, this is a very unusual way of defining a curve. I am defining a curve by defining the not curve. You're actually defining the, you know, what's, what's off of it. So for kappa, for kappa between 0 and 4, you end up with a fractal curve. But it's simple, simple in the sense of non self intersect Is kappa the conductivity for the heat equation or is it reciprocal? The, the kappa, the, 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 the diffuse, diffuse if, 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 you, if, if, if you, I guess you would be, it's not the reciprocal. So it's, it's like the if, if you're thinking in terms of heat equation, it's the diffusion constant. Okay. Or twice it, depending on how you define right, the right, diffusion right. constant. Uh, okay. Uh, for for kappa between four and eight, it kind of looks like this. It bounces off itself. And in this case, the GT, the domain of GT, is the unbounded component of this. And for kappa bigger than 8, this is very hard to draw. It's a space filling, plane filling curve. Ever tried to draw a plane filling curve that doesn't cross itself? It takes a while. It takes a long time, right? But I'm going to stop. So, because I haven't written, well, yeah, I haven't written. Since it's space filling, it has to visit the same points more than once. But is it some points visit the same Is it like bound at number of times? Is it, is it not more bound on how many times it visits? Yeah, in fact, in fact, I'm not sure it visits any point more than twice. Okay. It doesn't. And, mo and most points are not visited twice. Yes. But some points are visited twice. Yes. So, so not all visits, it's still it's unique through. So existence is kind of obvious, but uniqueness, so if you have this pro interjector, it's the corresponding to G of T. Is this part of the theorem? Is this probability one? one. This, uh, this right, I mean, crowding in motion with probability one is a measure on curve. <coughs> For each curve, it's a deterministic operation that takes that curve and puts it in the differential equation and solves it. But it is not clear that this solution is unique true, so it is a kind of differential equation. Oh, the differential equation has a unique solution. It is continuous. The, I mean, you mean the Lerner equation? Yeah. Lerner equation is, you know. It is, because you need some leakages or something, you know. No, no, look at the You're, equation. The, the equation is off the boundary. The equation lives in, this, in, in the really nice part of the world. The curve, is, the curve is where the equation no longer makes sense. I thought I, I, I knew what you meant by a self-avoiding curve, but it's not clear. I, did, I didn't know. What, what's the definition of a self-avoiding curve in your, for you? One that, that does not return to any point it's already been. But that would be objective, and you said that they, I mean, in this range, when cap is bigger than 8, they can't be injected, right? So. Right, okay. No, that's, okay. Okay, yeah, let, let me ask that question. I started by taking a measure on simple curves, derive something, which is what ODET did. Um, and then I actually produce something that it sometimes doesn't live on simple curves. 
So actually, I try to produce something that for some values of kappa actually don't satisfy the conditions I started with. So you're absolutely right there. So he states a problem, finds a solution, but there's more solutions than originally thought. Yeah. So. I might ask you a question. Is it because when you go to continuous space, the cells avoiding curve, the limit of it, can actually touch it? Theor is, theor is, is, is it Theoretically, it could. It turns out the self avoiding walk is expected, we'll see, to be one of the kappas less than four. And the loop arrays will be one less than four, but the percolation exploration process will be one of the kappas bigger than four. So I actually, this percolation exploration process, which I showed you, was self-avoiding on the discrete scale, but is, is not self-avoiding in the limit. See, so you're absolutely right that you can't be sure just because it's self-avoiding on the discrete level that it's self-avoiding in the limit. Does one know how the Hausdorff dimension of this thing depends on kappa? <laughs> the Hausdorff dimension of the paths is 1 plus kappa over 8. Wow. Sorry. <laughs> well, I hadn't, I hadn't said it yet. I hadn't said it yet, but it was there. In that regard. So, for, in fact, so it's for all kappa less than, for, for every dimension strictly between 1 and 2, there's exactly one value of kappa. And then once kappa equals 8 and it's plane filling, then it's 2. Okay. Um, I'm going to skip. Uh, I, well, I, I do want to make one case since I do this a lot. So, the fundamental tools for studying SLE are those of stochastic calculus. I've been saying the push this. Um, basic probability Brownian motion stochastic calculus. Let me make this push. This should be in graduate curricula everywhere for people to learn. This is becoming more and more important. And the basics of this, the probability community hasn't been so good about, about giving easy ways to get into the subject. But it's really, it's not that difficult and very important. I mean, I just very quickly I want to say here. Like, for instance, to say which cap was an SLE at double points, it turns out to end up having a very simple stochastic differential equation. And if I take a process xt and it moves 2 over xt dt with that, the question goes out to, it, does this thing hit the origin or not? And a one-dimensional, that's me, but this is a way short time, I think I will stop there. Um, I do want to say a little bit about, you know, how do you determine which cap or for which model? Well, if you happen to know the Hausdorff dimensions of your curves, you would, you would know what it was. But in many cases, you're trying to figure out what the Hausdorff dimension of the curves are. Um, here, th this, this actually situation is where, where, where one wants to look at non-probability measures. So suppose I have a domain and I have the measure, the curve there. And suppose I would say, how does the measure of this curve change when I perturb the boundary, say, away from the curve. <coughs> because the limit depended on, on the boundary. And it turns out you can write the, the rat I make it in derivative here. And I want to say, well, if I d prime is the, say, d prime is the larger domain, d is the smaller domain. So uh, the measure of the smaller domain compared to the larger domain is equal to well, first, it's just an indicator function. If the curve isn't in the smaller domain, it gets zero measure. And then there's a term here, uh, which is e to the, I won't say what this is. This, this turns into a Brownian loops, but it's something which turns out to be conformally invariant. There's a measure on curves, a measure on curves that intersect both gamma and the uh, perturbation staying in d. And this thing is a uh, just a conformal invariant, a Brownian loop measure. It's one I've never actually seen any place else. And I'm actually curious. Uh, I don't have time to describe it in much detail here. But it doesn't depend on kappa. And then there's a constant which does depend on kappa. And we now write it as c over 2. <coughs> um, being an analyst, I think using c as a parameter since c should always be an arbitrary constant. But c, this case, c is a parameter from the physics world that we really need to live with. It's called central charge. So central charge is the main way, way in the physics literature and a formal field theory in general to distinguish different conformal fields. And the related, 
So the relationship between central charge and kappa, for those who know what it means, is given by this. I'll just say, for SLE, uh, central, this number C is always less than or equal to 1. Uh, for C equals 1, we get the double root of kappa equals 4. And for C less than 1, we get one root of kappa less than 4, one with one bigger than 4. And kappa, and kappa equals 4 is also the very much the cutoff between simple and non-simple halves. Now, if we look at this, this actually tells a way to distinguish well, so think about how this C goes. Let's first look at the self-avoiding walk. The self-avoiding walk was the limit of measures where the measure for any walk was e to the minus number of steps. If I perturb the domain, that doesn't change the measure of this path at all. I just lose some paths. So for self-avoiding walk, we expect c to equal 0. Are you going to explain the connection uh, why it's called central charge in the relation to the gross R algebra, or is that not? No. I, 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 I'm not going to because I have an hour talk. Uh, so I, I'm sorry, but I, I can't. So there are good answers? There are, there, there, yeah, there are cases where there are very good answers, yes. yes. Oh, so there's no general answers, is that what you say? It's a general answer, I mean, in a rigorous mathematical sense, which is what you're doing. Well, what do you mean to rigorously, since a, I mean, Dirichlet algebra is algebra. Okay. You can produce things with SLE, who's, and produce things with the algebraic structure of Dirichlet algebra with the appropriate value of C. So in that sense, it's rigorous. Uh, I can, you can't rigorously say that someone else's non-rigorous argument was correct. That no, I, I, right. I, I but, don't want to see that. <clears throat> but you can construct things. Because I surely don't see an, a Virasar algebra out of what you've done so far. OK. The Virasar algebra comes from various, uh, to use physics language, expectation values or integrals you take with respect to these measures in particular, as, as I take various different points and things like I can I can fix points. And I can take the measure of the set of paths. Yeah, it's, 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 it's beyond the hour time to. Yes. We need another talk tomorrow if you want to rearrange your schedule and all of that. Well, I, my, my, I get picked up at 4.45 a.m., but I can talk at 3 a.m. <laughs> okay. Okay. okay, you're on. You're on. You're on. <laughs> okay. Um, for the loop race walk, um, the loop race walk's a little tricky. The measure on this path, the loop race walk, is the measure of the set of simple walks, regular random walks, whose loop ratio gives you this. If I make my domain smaller, I actually lose some walks that produce this path. So for the loop race walk, you would see that if you shrink the domain, the intrinsic measure of a path should decrease. And you would expect c to be less than 0. It turns out loop race walk turns into c equals minus 2. OK. I'm already, so I want to uh, just quickly go over some stuff here, it's, uh, various cases of what's known. Uh, the first major problem solved had to do with Brownian paths. And since I've determined, let me skip to the picture. Uh, this picture, unfortunately, by my, my standards, is not very good. It's from uh, Mandel Broad's Fractal Geometry of Nature. But what he actually did was he took a random walk or Brownian motion, getting it at the same point, and this is the outer boundary of the, of the path. And at that time, he made the very bold conjecture that that was a four-thirds dimensional set, and even was a very good candidate for self avoiding walk. Um, and he also made some other conjectures that turned out to be wrong. But let's emphasize the ones he made that are correct. correct. Uh, and it turns out that uh, we were able to show that the dimension of this actually is four thirds. And in fact, later work showed that basically the boundary of the Brownian curve is basically the same as SLE eight thirds. Cap equals eight thirds if you plug into the formula that gives you dimension four thirds. Uh, for critical percolation, 
Stas Smirnov proved in the triangular lattice that, that satisfies Hardy's formula. And based on work uh, that had been done before that, he was able to show that the limit of percolation is SL6. Now, cap equals 6, you could actually it satisfy a certain property called locality. Uh, and in this, in many cases, one can tell that if you're going to have a limit, you would have to satisfy certain conditions. So the only possible candidate for percolation would have to be cap equals 6. And it turns out that, that Smirnoff has done that, but only for the triangular lattice, which is particularly nice. Triangles and percolation go together very well. Very much you can see that from Cardi's formula with equilateral triangle is the thing. And uh, it's still open in other uh, domains to uh, other lattices to do this. For the loop race random walk, the uh, uh Bird and myself, we actually proved the scaling limit of loop race walk is SLE2. And that gives dimension 5 fourths. Now, number 5 fourths, then this is the example where the number 5 fourths came from the physics literature. But the, one of the people who actually proved it, I tried to ask him exactly, I asked him various problems about, is, is this 5 fourths or is this 5 fourths? This, and he wasn't able to answer those questions. That's his, uh, he knew it was an important number. Uh, before this, uh, there was a discrete thing using domino tiles that Rick Kenyon did that actually also was a different version of a, a, a rigorous statement with dimension 5 fourths on the discrete level, but not, but not the limit. Um, the loop race walk is related to something called uniform spanning tree. And a uniform, if I take a graph, take a piece of the graph, uniform spanning tree is just a tree that, that uh, well, a spanning tree is a tree that uh, has every edge. Uniform spanning tree means a spanning tree chosen from the uniform distribution over all spanning trees. Sorry, you mean each vertex, right? Each vertex. I said, I meant each vertex. Thank you. I, I want you to put that. Each vertex. And associated to a spanning tree is actually a path, which is sort of lots of, you know, if I've got a, I'll just draw a little bit of it. If I've got a, something like this, I go path that does this. That, the scaling limit of that path actually is SLE8. That's actually space filling because it goes, goes, goes everywhere. Uh, okay, no more break it. Uh, Gaussian free field. Uh, I don't have time to define that, but I'll just say that Odette Schramm and Scott Sheffield uh, showed that it's related to cap equals 4 and, and show values of that. And that's the C equals 1 theory. And just you know, exciting work you may want to invite people down for. Scott Sheffield is doing the most exciting work right now on uh, quantum gravity, trying to really understand the relationship between these things. And that's, I, I'm running short of time, so I'll just say, uh, talk to Scott Sheffield. He's got lots of exciting things to say. Uh, there's the easy model, which I didn't have a chance to um, define here. Uh, but there, uh, Scott Smirnoff is able to show the limit in the square lattice is uh, SLE3 with C equals 1 half. By the way, for all of these models, the value of C, the physics literature already knew. This is nothing, nothing new. And some of the dimensions, but the exact facts about the ge geometry, they, they don't know. Um, Q not equal to 2 in the pots, and that presumably is also the other you, you can, there is a, in those cases, there are conjectures, but not proof. But but the relation, but, you, but the, you, you can say because the Q not equal to two, the literature will tell you what the right C is, and then you can figure out what the right cap has to be. Yeah. But, 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 but they're projections. As far as I know, they've not been proven. Uh, for the self-avoiding walk, well, we already see the scaling of the selfie walk should be C equals zero, which is what we call restriction property. And if you look at the formula, it gives cap equals eight thirds. Um, Note that we've just used the restriction property to give us kappa equals 8 thirds. That's all about SLE. I can then use that in the fact about dimension to get the number 4 thirds. So this 4 thirds and 3 fourths comes as an SLE calculation, completely independent of what was done before. Um, there are simulations that strongly support the conjecture of the limit of, of 
uh, self voiding walk is SLE eight thirds. And in fact, I never liked the physics arguments as to why self voiding walk limit should be conformally invariant. I'm now a strong believer because you assume conformal invariance, it tells you what the actual distribution is, and that actual distribution can now be tested by simulation and find things they couldn't find before. And yes, lo and behold, they're right. Uh, but it's still an open question to prove the scaling limit of self voiding walk because that's not the Okay. Uh, well, I'm going to very quickly make a couple of comments. Um, so, overall, SLE, unlike some other things that mathematicians has done, has been relatively well, re well received by the physics community. And there are physics people doing SLE. It's recognized it's not just computed some numbers that they already knew how to do, it's taught, them, it's taught ideas that they did not know. So, unlike some other, and there are now non rigorous physics papers doing SLE as well. Is there such thing as a rigorous physics paper? <laughs> uh, there's rigorizable. In other words, you think there's no such thing as a rigorous physics paper, is that right? No. No, no, no but, there, but there are papers where it would be a student exercise to put the rigor in. And there are papers where you need more than that. Some of, by the way, some of the ones of these are really student exercises to put, I mean, they're, they're, yeah. but, they're, but they don't care about putting every epsilon and delta. Uh, some of the things going on now is considering what happens in non-simply connected domains. We use the Riemann mapping theorem. It's a, it's a domain Markov property, and the formula variance defines things exactly for simply connected domains, which need to need consider non-simply connected domains. Uh, and this is one thing which, which a number of people, including myself, have spent a fair amount of time on recently. I need to go quickly here. Um, I should also say SLE, and this is probably had problems understanding this. SLE is a path, path growing, but it's not a it's not saying something that actually happened in nature. These boundary interfaces did not grow like this. It's an artificial construction. Even though we write as the dynamics of Brownian motion, it's really just giving conditional probabilities and understanding. And it makes some hard, some hard things to prove. Like, it was a hard proof of uh, Dauphin John to show that SLE from Z to W is the same as SLE from W to Z reversed. But that is true, at least for capital Wall Street number four. For four to eight, um, very recently, Scott Sheffield and uh, Jason Miller have, have announced a proof. Um, something else I've been spending a lot of time on recently is parameterization. Early on with the Lerner equation, I said, parameterize this curve so we have that 2t. That 2t in that coefficient is a parameterization by capacity. In these paths like self morning walks, there's a natural limit of, you know, you, just, you should take, you know, one time step per move and scale that down. And you might ask, oh, is this essentially the same parameterization? The answer is no. It's singular with respect to it. So can one discuss the, the appropriate parameter, the appropriate practical natural parameterization? Um, and now we now understand, with uh, joint work with various people, Scott Sheffield, uh, Wang Shu, student writers, uh, uh, that this uh, natural parameterization exists for SLE, we're going to find it, but it's still open to uh, uh, at this point to uh, prove that discrete objects with their natural parameterization approve this. Um, let me just by saying there's a lot of work being done in conformal invariance in relation to uh, two-dimensional things. And I, I focused on SLE, but there's a lot of work also going on in the same generality that's not SLE related. And in some sense, this field of conformal invariance in two dimensions, uh, so you'll think of it as being SLE. SLE is one part of a larger Thing. It's a part I'm very much into, but uh, for, the, for instance, it's a special semester right now at MSRI, and generally on two-dimensional statistical mechanics. And I think it's five o'clock, so maybe I should stop there. Thank you. Will the holder exponent of this natural parameterization? Um, the conjecture is 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 it it's what it should be. Three fours. Uh, well, three, yeah, if D's for, yeah, I mean, if you have a particular dimension, there's, oh. an, there's an obvious thing that you would choose. So, 
The answer is we expect that to be true. That's not been proved. Oh, what, what, what that? What, I see. Was the exponent predicted by the dimension? Yeah, okay. right. Uh, but a student of mine, uh, who's finishing this year, Brent Wordes, has proved that you can parameterize SLE, so it has that parameterization, so it has that parallel direct exponent, which is the best you could possibly have. The natural one you want to hold I We don't know rigorously. Okay. It's got to be, it's got to be right. Something we do know is the Hurlder exponent for SLE under the capacity parameterization. And we know it rigorously. It's a funny number. It's probably not relevant, particularly relevant. But, but, but Hurlder exponent is very parameterization dependent. I didn't quite follow what you said about the non simply connected case. Is, is there a natural version of SLE there? Um, well, ODED's first paper said, suppose you have a probability measure satisfying conformal invariance and uh, domain Markov property, then it's this. If your definition of SLE is something which satisfies those two conditions only, then there are multiple ways to extend to multiply connected domains. So you have to find other ways to do it. My personal preference, I gave that when I gave, when I, let me just, um, the work that I've been doing, uh, has been focusing on this definition, which extends. Uh, I can give, I can talk about the Radon Nikodym derivative uh, between domains. This Brownian loop measure doesn't mind being in, non, in multiply connected domains, and that's the approach I've been using. But it, but but from a physics perspective, there are there are very, you, there's lots of possibilities you can have. I mean, this is the right thing to do for self-voiding walk, for loop race walk, and for some other cases, but I'm not saying it's the only possible way of doing it. So has this, all this progress in two dimensions pushed like the three-dimensional case even epsilon further, like a polymer in three-dimensional space? Probably starts with at the beginning. Or is it just the same state it was before my, the SLE? My, 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 now you have to me to my last slide, which is answering. Oh. What about three oh, dimensions? Okay. <laughs> Why are you doing your last one? <laughs> because, um, okay, uh, just for those who don't, I mean, three dimensions is kind of, it's trickier. I mean, the questions that, like self voiding walk and loop race walk are very much interesting questions in three dimensions. Above three dimensions, they become less interesting, they actually become trivial. Percolation is, is non trivial, three, four, and five dimensions, and the sixth starts becoming interesting. Um, but basically, uh, oh well, I've written some stuff there, but I'll just say uh, it's not necessary. We don't even necessarily believe that the limits are conformally invariant. If they were conformally invariant, we wouldn't know what to do with that anyway. Well, they're not very many control maps. So right, exactly. Uh, so, I mean, they should be rotate scale, there should be scale about invariant, rotation invariant limits. And in the case of loop race block, Gadi, Gadi, uh, Gadi Kozla showed that fact, that weak fact that there's. Uh, but well, not it wasn't even Brownian motion is conformally invariant. What? Not even Brownian yeah, motion right. is conformally yeah. invariant in free space. Um, now, I do wonder myself whether or not the perspective of uh, studying a curve by studying off the curve may be useful. You can still talk about the effect of, you can look at the potential off the curve and look at its derivative and moving the curve. And that may be a lesson which can be extended to three dimensions. Well, if you had like a three dimensional self avoiding walk, you projected it. Now it can intersect, but maybe it intersects in some special way or. But the intersection like doesn't seem to be conformally invariant. That, and there have been some very low level computer tests of this that makes it look like, you know. No one really expected it to be, and it doesn't look like it is, at least in, in simple way. Also, I mean, in three dimensions, I mean, nothing is inside on these exponents. Like in three dimensions, Flory predicted nu equals three fifths, five thirds dimensional paths. And numeric showed that's almost surely wrong, and it's 0.588 dot dot dot. And in fact, in three dimensions, all these exponents, look, they probably exist, but not only do they have to take a rational value, there's sort of no reason to believe we will ever know what they are. Well, that number's right. Yeah. <laughs> what? That's your interpretation. Dot, 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 dot is your rational. <laughs> you see the dot, dot, dot? <laughs> so, I mean, just to clarify, a grounding path in dimension three is not self-employed. 
It is not self-reporting. Yes, and, and, and four dimensions is the critical, and that's why the, that's why four dimensions is the critical for both loop race walk and self-reporting walk. That's why four dimensions is the critical value. Uh, the six, I'll just say for percolation in, in 30 seconds, in, no, 15 seconds, the fact that in percolation it's the relationship of three paths that, that affect things. And it's something called a triangle condition, and triangles of percolation, and that's why six turns out to be the critical dimension. But that's not, that's not known rigorously at all. So in three dimensions, in terms of open, possible open problems in three dimensions, that I, is, Another thing that can be done is, can we, think, can we find some interesting distribution on a three-dimensional curve that produces a simple path that interacts with its past, just as a candidate, just to find some way. I mean, that, that's just, you know. Well, when I was a graduate student, I went to a lecture in 1965 at IDA, and Milner was the lecturer. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember? <laughs> <laughs> he showed, I don't know exactly how he formulated it, he showed that he considered a random path in free space that closed up so you could condition. Yeah, that's no problem. Then it was the probability one it was knotted. Remember that talk? Nope. <laughs> <laughs> you remember the proof? Do you have tubes around it? Somehow? We have these annular shells, and then each annular shell has a chance that. Not I, I mean, I, I hope you're not insulted if I don't say that's really not that difficult to show. No, no, I, it's not <laughs> And since you don't remember it, I, this is, uh, <laughs> I mean, I, well, okay. Actually, I, I don't know exactly what distribution you put on curves. Brownian. Brownian, yeah. But, but, but for, 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 Brownian, for Brownian curves, anything that happens, you can't, couldn't be positive, it has to be zero or one. And it's easy to show that's bigger than zero. One, it one. Therefore, it has to be one. One, one, one. There's the proof. <laughs> no, no. I mean, it was one. Yeah. Right. But it's, but, it's, but it's sort of scaling says it can't be no, no, in I between. Didn't. No, no, that's probably Because everything, there's all these different scales that can, they can not. Well, I think the formulation is not trivial because the, the, the class is not embedded, as you said. So I don't know how it was formulated to be dotted. So. Right. But anyway, no, matter how, no, matter how, no, no matter how no matter how you formulated it, it would be scale invariant, so that on each scale you'd have a positive probability of knotting, and you have an infinite number of scales. Any other questions for the speaker? Okay, so let's thank the speaker.